Hi, good afternoon. So, hi, good afternoon again. My name is April Cabedo. I serve as the Senior Sales Manager for CRIF Philippines. And I'm very honored to serve as your host for this afternoon's webinar. This afternoon's free webinar titled Visa Transaction Score, Improve your, Improving Your Credit Risk Evaluation Using Visa Score, hopes to empower you as credit and analytics professionals with the insights and knowledge you need to know to manage the risk of, of your customer's delinquent, delinquency. But before we jump off to our insightful speaker, allow me to remind everyone of CRIF Philippines event policy in compliance with the Data Privacy Act. During the, during the registration to this event, our attendees have provided their prof professional information, including your name, the company you are currently working in, contact information, and your designation. This information will be used to update our marketing and global customer database. The information may also be shared with our speakers and panelists. If you have any questions regarding how CRIF BNB maintain your professional information, you may send us an email at conduct.ph at CRIF.com. This event is also being recorded. The recording will be shared with you after the webinar. Parts of the recording will also be used for CRIF's digital content marketing and will be uploaded in our social media pages. We encourage our guests to make full of use to make full use of your time and participation. You may network with our attendees by using the chat box below, found on your um, Zoom application, whether, are you, whether you are viewing us from your phones, laptop, desktops, or computers. You can type your questions in the chat box. Just make sure you are sending it to everyone so that our panelists can view and answer your questions. You can also type your professional information if you would like to network with our impressive list of attendees. Finally, your microphones are muted. You may use the Q&A box if you have clarifications or questions regarding the content, content of our panelists. You may also use the raise hand function during the panel discussion if you would like to ask your questions direct, directly to our panelists. So before I turn over the floor to our valuable speaker, um, let me show some slides um, regarding CRIF. The name of the company is CRIF. We are heavy on the credit, credit information on business. Um, we are actually operating in the market for almost 35 years. And then we have present in, presence in 35 countries across four regions, namely um, US, Europe, Middle East, and Asia. So the, as you will see, there are a lot of um, figures here, but I would, this only shows you how significant, I'm sorry, how stable the company is and we are growing continuously. So basically, basically this slide only shows you our global footprints. This is where you see us um, operating. And then um, just to share with you, these this are the service offerings of CRIF here in the market. For the end-to-end -end digital lending solutions, we have loan origination system, collection system, decision engine, and then under data, we do have credit bureau data, business information, corporate assessment, and rating. Lastly, for the analytics, we, have, we do have credit scoring models, IFRS 9, credit and marketing um, analytics. So there, so much about um, CRIF. So let me... Um, proceed to the main agenda of this webinar. So tremendous challenge have fallen on credit and analytics professionals within lending and financial institutions. Visa transaction scores will allow you to improve and refine your risk evaluation methods if considered as an, as an alternative score. This will complement the typical scores that you're using in evaluating the risk of your borrowers. Here to talk about Visa's alternative Alternative scoring, we would like to welcome Mr. Robert Langton. Uh, Mr. Robert Langton, he's a business development director of the division called Transaction Underwriting Scores at Visa. He has a 22-year career in financial service and credit risk data services. Extensive experience within data and analytics for global credit reference um, agencies and currently leading business development across APAC and EMEA. So let us please welcome to our digital stage, Mr. Robert Langton. Thank you, April. And uh, thank you, Chris, for allowing us the opportunity today to talk you through our credit risk data journey here at Visa. It's, it's been quite a journey over the past few years, and I'm going to talk you through 
what we've done to date, what we found and what we're seeing in different regions around the world, um, whilst referencing these and transaction data for credit risk. Perfect. OK, so I'm going to talk you through the consumer risk services we have here at Visa um, and what we've been doing over the past few years with regards to trying to leverage Visa data for the benefit of, of credit risk and financial services organisations. Run through uh, sort of the opportunity, um, high level, um, what transactional insights could, could bring to the credit lifecycle for. From there, we'll look at the visa solutions that will enable credit decisioning. Uh, we'll go through a few case studies that we've seen globally today, and then I'll run you through the details of how we get started with this proposition. So a few years ago, Visa um, took some feedback from our, our global issuers in terms of what they would like to see from us uh, as a data service. So Visa is, is a global company, operates in, in many countries around the world. We hold a huge amount of data linked to the transactions that are completed on Visa cards. When we spoke to our issuing clients, um, they asked us to look into what we could do for the, the full customer lifecycle from initial onboarding and underwriting uh, through to customer engagement, proactive outreach, uh, potentially looking at things like credit line increases and decreases, um, through, to, through to the more general customer management. And for those that didn't make it successfully around the, the cycle of, of um, a financial service, those that would then potentially fall into the collections and recovery space. Um, we looked at the transaction data and, and now how a high level is that it can provide incremental insight over traditional data sources um, that will, will bring additional benefits for, for financial services providers. So to, to start off with uh, introduction into Visa's um, central database, VisaNet, um, it's a huge system that can capture up to 65,000 plus transactions per second. And that's powered across 200 plus countries, uh, linking into in excess of 16,000 financial institution clients processing trillions and trillions of dollars every year. Um, I need to update this slide, actually. It's now 3.8 billion cards worldwide that are now linked to the Visa network. And, and we've looked at this in two lenses, uh, consumer and, and also what we can do for small business. But we're going to focus in on the consumer solutions we've developed today, uh, and that would be our cardholder transaction score and our aggregated card spend attributes. So when we started to look through the data, um, we started to see a gap in, in the market in terms of what we call traditional slim file customers. So new to credit, those people that have a limited credit history. So this was sort of the primary use case we explored. And what you see here is an example of two applicants that look fairly similar. Uh, both have the same income, both have the same overall annual spend, and both have very limited credit histories. And as a result, both would potentially be declined for credit because they exceed the expected. However, when we linked in some of Visa's transactional data, we can see that actually applicant A is, is far more suitable for credit because we can see that they, they spend some of their money traveling internationally. From our research, um, we, we can see that people that travel internationally are a lower credit risk. Um, there's been no spends on, on gambling uh, from applicant A, and there's also been no authorization fails. Of course, that's another thing that Visa see across network. You can see if there's any card declines uh, linked to a card. Uh, whereas if we look at applicant B, uh, there's actually more credit risk there because we can see there's been no international travel. However, there has been um, some spends at a casino, at, but also there's been two authorization files, which indicates poor, poor account management at a personal level. If we get into these solutions in, in more detail, the two things that we, we've brought to market are cardholder transaction score. Now, this is a probability of default score, and this is where we look at the previous 12 months worth of transactional data to predict the likelihood of credit default in the coming 12 months. When we say credit defaults, we're talking about 60 days plus missed payments on, on a commitment. We took the score to, to market as a sole product initially when we started a few years ago, um, but the feedback from our clients was we'd actually like to see more data linked to this service from Visa, and that's where we developed the aggregated card spend attributes. So this is where we will take the spend we see at a card level and break that down into separate categories. So starting off with a general overview around typical tech spend volumes, we'll then move through into things like number of transactions and typical card activity through to spending habits, um, where, where money is being spent, uh, whether there's large cash withdrawals, a uh, few through then to sort of uh, more lifestyle spend categories and what they're spending on certain, certain uh, elements, um, probably split between discretionary and non-discretionary spend. If we start with the risk score, uh, the risk score itself was, was developed 
uh, off a sample of 150 million or starting sample of 150 million credit and debit cards. And what we started to look at was, was the attributes linked to that that were indicative of credit risk. So this is some high level examples here. Um, we looked at spend volumes and categories. So this is looking at how much card are to Robert, spend. Sorry for a while. Uh, we are receiving some feedback from the audience. Um, can you um, talk a little bit slower? I'm sorry. I do apologize. I do apologize. I have a habit of speeding up on these presentations. Okay, no problem. So um, looking at the, the cardholder transaction score, when we developed the model, we started to look at the, uh, the attributes linked that we could see at a card level and how they were indicative of credit risk. So they fall into three broad categories. Um, first one being spend volume and, and the categorization linked to that. So Visa has an advanced categorization engine. Every single merchant, uh, so this would be a shop, be this e-commerce or face-to-face -face store, has a merchant category with Visa. And we applied those merchant categories and spend a uh, merchant category level to every card, looking to see um, what insights we could generate from that. So this, uh, looking at volumes, we're looking at this, the spend volumes where an individual is spending their cash uh, and the associated risk. Now, I've mentioned previously that cardholders that spend overseas, as an example, are relatively lower risk than those that do not. Um, moving on to category number two, looking at spend patterns and stability. Um, sudden changes in spend patterns indicate an underlying change in economic situations. So you could broadly split out spends uh, at a card level into discretionary and non-discretionary items. So there would be things that all of us as individuals need to buy month on month, year on year to survive, such as uh, food, groceries. Um, we'd also maybe need to spend on fuel to power our vehicles to travel to and from work. Uh, then we have things that are more discretionary. So uh, spend at restaurants, um, spend on subscriptions uh, and, and things of that nature. So we would we look at that, that spend pattern and the stability over time. Uh, as part of the model and the stability is quite key because if you see any sudden changes or decreases in spend it is, it is indicative of a change in underlying situations for the card holder uh, of course if people have less income they will spend less money um, fairly straightforward um, assumption to make from looking at the stability of spend and an example here of, of obviously is, is that individuals that have a higher number of reoccurring charges or subscriptions um, are indicating greater stability. Now, here at Visa, we see more and more subscriptions year on year as we as consumers move more to a, an e-commerce driven way of consuming media. As an example, we would see the subscriptions for companies for the like of, of, of Spotify or music streaming services, of course, Amazon for where, where they're relevant and then things like, like Netflix and other associated streaming services for, for media. And then, and then finally, uh, a key indicator of risk um, that we can see is authorization decline. So this is where we see a decline for a payment. Uh, and that could be through a number of reasons, but the ones we pay uh, particular attention to are declines due to insufficient funds, which is indicative uh, of poor customer management. This is the full list of card spend attributes we've developed in, uh, with feedback from financial services providers. And this is where we're giving the more granular view of what we see at card level. So uh, start with the basics, you can confirm overall payment volumes, and this can be linked to declared income as well. So you can see what the payment volumes are on the card and, and make an assessment whether you think declared income uh, is actually correct or not. Um, through then to a slight a know your customer element, which we call engagement. So this would be months on book, the card's been with, with Visa, uh, including and that's the number of days since first transaction on the card. So number of days since first activity. We'd also uh, take a view of the number of active months we've seen in the past 12. So if you're using somebody's transactional data, you, we can see and we will let you know if the card that's been provided or the account that's been provided is, is relevant, if that's active and if that is, is a, a sort of a primary, uh, primary account for the individual. And then date of last transaction. We look at spend types. So this really talk about the spend behaviours of the individual at a high level. Um, what, what's their participation in e-commerce like with online payment volumes? 
Um, so in Visa World, this would be card not present at point of purchase. We'll, we can confirm spend uh, withdrawals at ATM, whether there's large amounts of cash withdrawals or not. And then if there's been any cross-border face-to-face spend or cash withdrawals as well over the previous 12 months. We will confirm authorization declines um, and number of declines due to insufficient funds. And then we will look at and provide the spend counts for various categories. As we mentioned, um, essential spends, food, grocery, fuel, healthcare, telcos, utilities, and insurance. And then some examples of discretionary spends, such as restaurants, uh, QSRs, in, in, by the way, in Visa World is quick service restaurants, so takeaways, um, fast food, uh, and then through to, to travel. And that's at an industry level. So that would include spend on travel um, with, with airlines or, or holiday provider uh, through to uh, Bureau de Change, um, through to other spends on tours and excursions. The use cases that this data is, is powering currently uh, and what we plan for the future is designed to improve approval rates at point of quote. Uh, so if we look at the new underwriting use case and increased share of applications processed as being straight through. So what we mean by straight through is processed with no manual intervention. Uh, so a process that is driven entirely via a data link um, between Visa, CRIF and, and the end client, um, which can then improve outcomes and save time on manual intervention, uh, which of course will reduce overheads. We see that the score uh, and the data we have at Visa is a fantastic uh, addition to what you'd already see from your traditional credit bureaus. And in this example, CRIF, um, this is an additional layer that gives a, a more insight uh, from what you can see today. And we'll move on to some of the benefits uh, further on in the presentation. The, 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 the scores themselves work across all Visa cards. So that would be Visa debit or Visa credit cards. Um, in countries that we've overlaid the scores for. Uh, and they are, they are delivered with explicit consent from the client. So consent would be captured at point of application. And then from there, we'll provide the data in a PCI, PCI DSS compliant way for consumption as part of a primary scorecard. As a part two, we're currently exploring ways of opening this data set to people that are new to country. So people that have recently migrated um, to a new country and are looking for financial services. Of course, they may be looking for a new bank um, local to them, uh, and they may be looking for additional financial services linked to their residency in a new country. As long as we can see the 16-digit um, card number, we can provide insights. But that's currently uh, in beta, and we're going through the, the legal and privacy impact reviews for that at the moment. For our, for our established customers or for customers that have been working with card details for a long time, we offer a, a range of customer management services as well. So this is ways of um, looking to move people that may be um, limited in what they do with an organisation today. For example, debit card holders, there's, there's opportunities to segment portfolios for um, credit products such as credit cards, personal loans or, or other financial services. Again, the data could be used to improve credit lines um, and look at that credit line assessment. So are we um, offering too much? Are we offering too little? Can we change the credit lines? And this helps with better targeting, cross-selling opportunities. But there's also potential by doing this to manage pre-delinquencies more effectively and also identify uh, customer engagement opportunities at an early stage that may benefit the the um, the financial services institution in the long run. There's also a range of high level services available through mar full market view, and this would be potential to benchmark against peers. What we're seeing elsewhere at a market level and understand where we are uh, with regards to sort of credit cycles and whether there's increasing risks uh, at a country or a more regional level within a country. And what we have here is an example of of the customer journey. So we're using a buy now, pay later example here, uh, Bob Pay. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if Bob Pay exists, I'm gonna say that they don't, um, but Bob Pay um, are a buy now, pay later company. Um, they would capture the customer application details today, you know, your standard information that you need to process a new application. From there, they would link into adding a payment method. And this is where they would capture Visa data. Um, because we then have got the relevant 16-digit card number we need to link to the information. 
They were confirmed that they're happy with data being referenced as part of the journey. And then from there, there's a, there's a go, no-go decision um, on, on the application. Just to talk you through what we've seen globally in some of the case studies today. So I said the score um, itself and, and the data has been used uh, and tested around the world now. So we start off with our initial launch position, which was in the US. And, and this is the benchmarking and around the creation of the score actually between the established credit bureau in the US FICO and their FICO scores against what we could see um, within Visa. And, and it's how we linked the initial sample back to outcome data. What we've done here is just is grouped all cards we could see uh, into 10 deciles, one being best, 10 to worst standards analytics process. But you can see the sloping factor here of the scores and also the differences between what we were seeing and, and what FICO was seeing in their different respective deciles as well. Um, this started off with the initial Gini index of 38, which was, was a good starting position and said this is an additional data source to be added on top of Bureau. You know, we're not looking at these data as a primary data source. It will always be to enhance what you do today, um, not replace anything. And again, um, looking through the, the FICO performance in more detail, this is an example of a large US issuer that we looked at, looked at um, for different services. And we actually found there's a genie here of, of 42. Um, again, there's a, there's a cross diagonal difference as you move from left to right on the, uh, by and large, we would see that there's, uh, there's segmentation and differences um, at the prime uh, mid-market level, the mass market level. We don't necessarily disagree with, with the bureaus at all, really, with what would be a high credit risk customer. We, we don't see that as, as a major difference. But um, there are differences between sort of what we see at a prime. And because we are assessing data and impact um, on transactions that were completed the previous month, you know, we, we can see changes ahead of time, um, which I'll, I'll show you in a few slides. We have an example here of a Greek issuer that worked with us to see what they could do with um, a debit to credit campaign. So looking at their typical delinquency rate in this market it was around 6.7%. But you can see from the segmentation of their customer base that anything really beyond Desart 5 would probably not be suitable for a credit product from our um, overlay of data. And, and this, this was a successful campaign. It helps the, 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 the Greek bank um, issue an additional 13,000 uh, credit cards to their existing debit base, and that generated additional payment volumes of over 50 million in country. We've done a lot of work as well with non-Visa clients. So here we're looking at um, uh, uh, financial institutions micro financial institutions in Ukraine. And this, these um, lenders were focused on short-term lending, short-term loans. And you can see the, the difference here in, in risk that we could see when we were overlaying our data on debit cards and credit cards. Um, huge, huge slope here in terms of overall credit risk and possibility of default or probability of default. Um, <clears throat> These services are live. Excuse me, one second. Looking at the this this uh, example here, but of course the risk is higher because we're talking about the non-prime space, uh, but we're also talking about a, a, a challenging environment. You know, these are short-term loans over a short period of time. But um, these these services are now live. Um, our first first bureau to launch uh, was in Eastern Europe. We have a, a partnership up and running now, and how that works, and then what we're talking to you guys about today is as an opportunity. Uh, is that we have a process um, established now within Visa. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a, a micro-financial institution. However, what we're doing today uh, in this instance is capturing the primary account number or the card number a point of application. Uh, we uh, will encrypt the card number um, from the application. We have um, software to do that um, to ensure that everybody remains PCI DSS compliant. Uh, and the encrypted pan is then sent through to the credit bureau. Uh, and that, that could be CRIF um, in the market we're talking about today. Um, CRIF would then send the encrypted uh, card number to us and we would return the associated data for that card uh, back to the bureau. The bureau would then uh, add our data fields to their API and the API would deliver all the data back to the financial services provider and they could make the decision on the loan. So seamlessly adding in additional data sets 
to what you already do today with one of your main Puro partners. We we'll go through, uh, finally, in terms of case studies, we'll look at the UK. And this is really the difference uh, that this data makes to existing traditional credit bureau data. So what you see here is an example of a comparative analysis where we compared our risk model to uh, an established uh, global um, credit bureau in the UK. And we grouped the, the scores into low, medium, and high risk bands. Now, there's, um, there are some differences you see on the low and medium risk segment. You know, this is a very established data market, a very established credit market. However, on the low risk segment, we were seeing that there was actually a, a slightly less than 1% we were seeing as high risk. So that would be prime customers. And we were seeing economic shock within 1% of that sample. Now, this was a 2.5 million sample of customers that we started with. Um, and then there was uh, sort of a medium risk in that prime space of 10%. So um, there was some additional insights to be gathered there. Uh, and there was a potential to improve loans, even to their lowest rate offers to customers. But then we were seeing the opportunities to expand uh, into the, into the um, medium risk market um, because you're seeing um, seeing low credit, low, low risk from us in 10% of the time there. So there's an opportunity to tighten at the prime end, but then opportunity to expand further into the, into the mass market. And a lot of um, thin file customers would benefit here. So people that are fairly new to credit, this additional data really helps people that don't have a um, large footprint within the established credit bureaus. And finally, as, as a headline, some of the things we see here from from the analysis is, is the time lag between what we see from transactional data and what is published within the credit bureau. So um, the bureaus will respond to missed payments on a credit commitment and the payment history. But because we are looking at, um, through the visa lens, transactional data, we are seeing the changes ahead of time before missed payments. So if you consider that uh, by and large, the majority of people around the world would try to honor their credit commitments. Most people don't take out credit with the aim of not paying it back. So to meet those credit commitments when there are income shocks potentially or other shocks um, to income or outgoings, people will cut back in certain areas. And I've touched on this earlier on in the presentation, you know, they will cut back on discretionary items and they will do that over a period of time. But then if that, uh, if that, poor economic condition continues for the individual, they'll then start to decrease their essential spend. So their grocery spend will start to decrease. They'll start to travel less and spend less on fuel for their car, et cetera. And then eventually they'll get to the point where they just, they just can't cut back anymore and they will miss, they'll miss payments on loan commitments. Now, the typical lag between us seeing that change um, and it being reported through to the Bureau is three months. So it's potential for three months early insight into uh, increasing levels of credit risk when you add in our data in addition to what's being provided by the bureaus today. In terms of positive change, um, bureaus do much, uh, much better here. Um, we, see, we see positive change uh, on average 30 days before the bureaus, which, um, which is what you'd expect. You know, the bureaus know when loans are going to end, and that's generally when people have more money to, to spend. And, and we'll, we'll see that spend you know, uh, almost immediately because uh, they have less less financial commitments to meet. Um, so, but still, still a 30 day early insight into improvements in credit risk. And skip through some of these case studies, guys, because we're going to be repeating a few of the things we've already gone through. But um, if we just now sort of closing remarks and then provide you with insights into how to um, access information, you know, Visa insights are, uh, and data are, are based on solutions from uh, our global view uh, and we're looking to help provide a better customer experience and more efficient processes for faster decision making. We'd like to get to the point where we can Im improve instant approvals in real time um, by adding our data to existing sources and automate decisions to a greater extent uh, with the overall aim of improving credit rates and en enhancing customer experience in a friendly fashion but also driven of course via that digital process. Um, this will lead to better customer management um, and the incremental insights are available for all Visa cardholders. 
as mentioned to you before, the, the service itself is live elsewhere in the world, but you know, available via API, via Visa Partners um, and CRIF in Philippines in particular. Um, we can deliver the, the data, um, as I said, as long as we can um, capture that card number at the point of acquisition, we can, we can power additional data into your scorecard. And we can also um, provide uh, help with, with capturing and authenticating the card as well. There are modules within Visa that will support um, card authentication if you would like to use them. Um, it's obviously totally optional, but we run services such as 3D Secure. Now, those of you that are Visa card holders and have made a purchase online may have been asked to set up with 3D Secure where you provide your password. But this is where we authenticate the card within Visa's realms. These are additional things that can be um, delivered. Um, but of course, we'll always need the client consent. Um, we obviously will help you with that as part of any onboarding process with the overall aim of being able to access Visa's data um, for point of originations or customer management. So in terms of next steps, the, the availability, um, the score and the data we've discussed today is available in multiple markets um, across the Asia Pacific region. Uh, it's definitely available in the Philippines. Uh, it's been available for a number of months now. Um, we're, we're more than happy to provide proof of concepts um, and, and data for testing, retro testing, and of course, walk through any integration um, or any integration questions you may have. Uh, but in fairness, if you're working with us through a partner, that would be will be covered off by Chris. So I'm going to stop there. I hope that wasn't too fast and you, you got the the overall theme of what we were talking about. Um, please um, let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you, Robert. We really appreciate you being here despite of your still recovering because of COVID. I also feel you because I'm also still catching my breath af up to now. So anyway, audience, we are more than happy to have an intelligent discussion with you on how you can use this insight to manage your customer evaluation process. Our, our expert is here to meet with you to start that discussion. We keep this program going with the panel discussion. We invite Robert to step into our digital stage so we can cover the questions that you have sent via chat box. I have received some that have been sent privately as well. So, yeah, we will try to address or answer all those um, questions in a while. And lastly, for our guests, if you have any questions or clarification, you can type your questions using our Q&A box, or you can also ask your questions directly by clicking the raise hand function. But yeah, most of the people are very shy, so most, oh, most of the time, they just PM the questions. In, in which case, we will acknowledge your name and unmute your mic. So... Performance data for score development is sought from FIs, question mark. Pulled performance data or specific a or specific FI performance. So yeah, we, we are looking to we are looking to to of course test and, and work with FIs to uh, establish performance. Um, uh, I mean, pulled, pulled performance data or specific FIs. I mean, we, we look at the model's performance um, overall. Um, so we will start from, from banking and move from there. So if you, you consider Visa's um, starting position and typical customer base, you know, we, we work with, with large banks, established banks and financial institutions um, through to um, independent credit card providers. Um, I mean, in terms, the model itself, yeah, is is, a, is pulled performance across the whole country. I mean, we we'll look at the model for every single card we see across a Visa network. Um, however, we can look to refine the model for specific FIs if required. Um, we had what we're talking about today is our standard model and standard variables. So, what we've seen is that um, some FIs would like to work with our risk score. Some FIs would like to just work with our data attributes and actually build their own um, their own model. So, and we're open to that either way. So, we're happy to support either function. Okay, thank you for that, um, Robert. Next, there are a bevy of standard consumer transaction variables being mentioned. How are micro or small business cards considered separately from standards con from standards consumer? from standard consumer cards they are on the same network but they they are separated within visas um visas uh services so 
What we've gone through today is, is the consumer transaction score. Now, that is a primary account number level model. So that's driven at card level. Um, and that's how the information is processed. And that's how the risk model and attributes are provided. That their insights are at that card level. For micro and small businesses, we look at things slightly different. Uh, we don't have this model available in the Philippines yet, but it's in the pipeline and it's due in, in the future. So what we look at for business cards and small micro small businesses is their inbound revenues. So we don't look at cards. <clears throat> we look at we look at their inbound revenues and then compare them to their peer group. So, you know, you may have two fast food outlets uh, within the same town, uh, but then we also have a view of all the fast food outlets in the whole country uh, and we will assess them against what we're seeing in terms of um, new customers, customer growth, uh, volume of business growth, um, bar ticket size. And then we'll also link that back through to um, what we've seen in terms of, uh, of typical closure rates. So patterns of transaction and volumes that were indicative of potential risks for that business. So it is, it is different um, as how we would assess risk. But yeah, we don't include micro or small business cards within the sample for consumer assessment. Thank you. You mentioned about taking into consideration the transactions on debit cards as well. First question, will it, will it have the some, maybe same weight as with the credit cards? And second question, based on your observation, how predictive is your score that is fully calculated based on debit transaction as compared to entirely based on credit card? So, so what we've seen <clears throat> um, when we've launched these services is that it's essential that we ask uh, an applicant for their primary card number. So that could be debit, that could be credit. It all depends on what the preference is of the individual and to what, um, which one of their cards they use the most. So if we can capture the, 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 the main volume cards, um, that's when the score will be most accurate because you have the most data to go from. We can also link in multiple cards as part of this. So we could capture more than one card at a point of origination as well. So we can provide a, a view of, of all Visa cards if needed. Um, in terms of how the model performs against credit, um, credit and debit, it all depends on the transactions that are completed at a card level. Um, you know, some people... Um, will use their credit card just for major purchases. And therefore, the insights are, are not going to be that great. You know, it's, when you get the attributes back, you'll see what the spend is. Um, and I think that's really why working with both solutions works quite well, because you can see the risk, overall risk model, but then you can also see the underlying data as well. So, you know, if a card isn't used very often, then the model's not going to perform well because there's no data to power the model. So really, it's essential that we capture that primary card and and from visas research uh, globally and, and in the philippines we see that most individuals <clears throat> will use one card well, it's about 95 percent of the population use one card as a primary card for around 95 percent of their transactions all right thank you robert so next um question what is the level of genie when card provided was a credit card versus debit card uh, again, it all goes back to, to card usage. So if the card's being utilised month on month, then the genie's exactly the same because we're seeing that volume of transaction. Mm -hmm. the, the genie's range, and it depends. On, I mean, we, we've, we've um, launched and piloted this service now in, in, around, in around 15 countries. So um, we've seen that the genie would range from, from high 20s to mid 40s, so from sort of 29 to 45. But that, that all depends on... on the data you're using today, uh, existing processes, et cetera. So there's quite a range there. I appreciate that. But that's why we're open to um, providing uh, retrospective agreements for this. Um, you know, and Visa won't look to charge for the data either. So, you know, it's a free, free uh, data available for assessment to, to build your own genie factor. Um, but yeah, credit and debit cards, it, it all comes back to, to usage and, and which, which one of those is being used more. All right. Thank you, Robert. Are micro or small business cards considered separately from standard consumer cards? Yeah, they, they are. Yes, they are. So um, the, 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 the small, small business cards are held within the, the, the 
visa uh, business services uh, ecosystem we, we don't assess those so from a from a legal and regulatory sign-off point of view um, we would need um, to amend wording and, and change how we process for small businesses as said now we do have um, a business model though so we, we think the business model is better so not looking at card spend at a micro level but looking at the inbound revenues for small business holders and, and assessing any applications um, as a business application as opposed to a consumer application. I, I appreciate there are crossovers though. So some small business owners actually just use a standard bank account. They don't actually have a business bank account. They haven't got maybe to the size where they need to do that. And, and if that's the case, all of those uh, transactions will be captured on their um, on their standard consumer debit or credit cards. What is the unique input key required to pull this transaction score? So it's the primary account number. So that is the 16 digit card number. And, and that is all. Um, we don't need expiry dates uh, or anything like that. We don't need any security codes. We just need the card number. What is the feedback from FI around the world on transactional data assessment at point of underwriting? Yeah, so it, it's been a real a real um, explosion during COVID times to looking at transactional data. So the feedback's been very positive for, for a number of reasons. Um, if we start off with, with the sort of impact, the immediate impact of, of the COVID pandemic, we saw around the world a huge increase in FIs using transactional data to assess um, forbearance on existing credit commitments. So for the individuals that were effective negatively um, from an employment point of view due to the, the lock, various global lockdowns and various country lockdowns, um, they, they were using transaction data to see the um, decrease in, in income primarily uh, and using that as a, as, a, as a checking point before they were, as they were making their assessment as to how to help um, their account holder. So a lot of this was delivered via open banking. Uh, in, in certain countries um, but then but then from there um, and moving into um, emerging markets there, there was the need to start looking at affordability assessment so what were the behaviors of the individual and were they stable and this is where we're seeing a, a lot of a lot of insight um, a lot of uh, interest in, in what we're doing here at visa is um, how, how can we understand this individual more, you know, what is their immediate circumstances, um, and you know, are they are they have they been good over over time as well? And it's an additional layer of insight. I think what we've what we've been what we've had recently actually is a lot of clients have, have termed our services uh, a light version of open data, in that we're providing the view of spend, which can be linked up back to declared income, uh, and there are potential options to to further enhance the data to come up with um, a range of income for an individual based on what we're seeing from their spends. So, um, yeah, it's been very well received for those reasons, really helping um, know your customer more, uh, but also understand what they can actually afford in terms of a credit commitment. For Visa credit card transaction, does the model reflect data at point of purchase near real time? Or when does are paid, example, on a monthly basis? If the answer is the latter, how is this, how is this different from the traditional credit data? Debit transactions are clear, clearly distinct, but it isn't clear how the Visa credit transactions are different from typical credit card data. So um, in, in the, the scores that we're talking about, say the risk model, and, and actually the, the well, the, um, transaction spends can be more real time, but the risk model is, is created on a monthly basis, on a, on a batch basis within Visa. Um, we haven't as yet had a request to create a real-time um, service, but that's certainly something we could we could look at. And if there's enough appetite for it, we, we could create a real-time service to provide those card spend attributes um, based on what we've seen within the last 48 hours, because we'd have to apply clearing. But currently, it's, it's a score that's processed each month. In addition to, to what you'd see though today with the bureaus, there's there's um, less of a less of a time delay with Visa because um, we see the transactions and we'll we'll collate those on a monthly basis. There's no delays there with 
um, for example, with credit card providers, sending a file through to the bureau for the bureau to then um, check and then update into the main file. So there's there's slight speed benefits, uh, but it all depends on the frequency of submission of data to the credit bureau. But what we also see within Visa is the authorization declines. So if we see somebody that's constantly trying to use a credit card that's already at limit and the the, the uh, transactions are being declined, we can, we can track that, we can report that back in the raw data attributes, but that's also part of the risk model. Again, indicative of somebody that um, is really not managing their accounts well. So poor account management equals uh, higher credit risk. Okay, thank you, Robert. What's the average hit rate or percentage of API calls for which you have actual transactional data in an, in emerging in emerging versus versus developed countries? Um, so, I mean, actual hit rate. So, I mean, every Visa card can be scored um, at a country level. Um, but we'd need to see a minimum of three months worth of transactions. So um, new cards, we won't be able to see new cards or we won't provide data on new cards because they are just too new to market to really make any assessment. However, we could provide the, the um, transactional attributes for those cards. Uh, in terms of uh, developed versus emerging markets for the risk model, we actually have two versions of the risk model. So we have... Um, the primary version, which is linked to developed markets, which is uh, based around digital transactions. So, um, you know, transactions using the card. And then we have a separate model for emerging markets where cash is still the primary source of, of payment. And that would then um, weight certain factors onto those, those ATM withdrawals. So there are two mar uh, models available. And depending on segment and feedback, both, both are available from Visa today. Of course, thank you to our speaker. <laughs> uh, we learned a lot and um, thank you as well to all um, the people who attended. Um, recording of this webinar will be made available on our social media and YouTube page. We encourage you to follow us to keep, your, or to keep yourselves updated on our webinar schedule and other finance-related white papers. So usually, we conduct um, webinar sessions on a monthly basis. We are excited to start a conversation with your team on how you can use data to make informed decisions. We will reach out to you via email to provide copies of the materials used this afternoon and perhaps set an appointment with you to, to keep this engagement and conversation um, going. Thank you very much for attending. This has been Crips webinar on Visa Transaction Score. Improving Your Credit Risk Evaluation Using Visa Score. My name is April Quevedo, and on behalf of the Enterprise team in the Philippines and around the world, maraming maraming salamat po.